Hi everyone, this is H Psychology, another video, addiction topic, so for paper three, addiction, explaining nicotine addiction, and this one is number one, brain neurochemistry, including the role of dopamine. We're going to be using, and we've used these reference textbooks. Okay, so we need to do a quick recap for this of synaptic transmission. So as you know, the electrical impulse is taken up by the dendrites of a new neuron, um, taken along towards the cell body, along the axon, down to the end bulb. And then we zoom in to this picture here. So the axon terminal, the end bulb, has contains these little vesicles, vesicles, which are little sacs containing the neurotransmitters. The electrical impulse forces these vesicles and the membrane of these vesicles to fuse with the axon terminal membrane, forcing these little neurotransmitters into the synaptic gap, where they diffuse across the gap and they're taken up by specific receptors, very specific receptors that act like a lock and key. So only certain receptor sites will be able to receive certain neuro neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters will have an excitatory or an inhibitory effect. Um, so the sum summated or summation occurs, which means the combined effect of these um, impulses will either cause uh, will cause an action potential to continue along the next uh, neuron. And as you know, we also have reuptake. And the video I've got on synaptic transmission deals with that. So we're now looking at just this and how this applies to nicotine addiction. So what we're specifically looking at here are these neurotransmitters and the receptor sites, okay, on this image. So with the dopamine uh, role, the role of dopamine in nicotine addiction, this ties in with the desensitization hypothesis. And this focuses, focuses specifically on a neurotransmitter called ACH, acetylcholine. So one type of receptor for the neurotransmitter ACH is, are called nicotinic receptors, okay, for short, this little abbreviation for short. Now these nicotinic receptors combined with both ACH and also nicotine. But when nicotine binds with them, the neuron is initially stimulated, but then within milliseconds, the receptor is shut down temporarily. So what this means is when somebody smokes or consumes nicotine, the nicotine molecules bind with the nicotinic receptor and blocks it then for ACH. So that means the number of active receptors for ACH is said to be down-regulated, meaning there are fewer available. And therefore that leads to something called desensitization of the neuron. So how does this get involved with addiction? Why is this relevant to addiction? Well, it also ties up with an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Okay, and this is linked with our reward and pleasure center. So in this area of the brain, the desensitization of these neurons triggers the release of dopamine, and dopamine being another neurotransmitter. And it's dopamine that creates pleasurable effects like mild euphoria, that feeling of increased alertness, uh, a feeling of reduction in anxiety. So, okay, so desensitization causes a release of more dopamine in the brain. Therefore, nicotine addiction occurs because the intake of nicotine causes the increase indirectly or directly really causes the increase of dopamine in our reward centers. And that high or pleasurable effect um, is very rewarding, very reinforcing for us. So the individual is then tempted to take that drug again to get that same hit. So this ties up with maintenance of the behavior. Okay, so the nicotine regulation model, why people continue to smoke. So eventually when smokers go without nicotine for a long time, so for example, when they're asleep, the drug is metabolized and it will disappear from the body. So what happens then is of course the ACH receptors become functional again, they become active again, and the neurons become sensitized. So high levels of ACH means we get 
upregulation because more receptors become functional. And that increase in ACH means we get a reduction in dopamine levels. So what happens is if we reduce that dopamine, we're not going to feel that um, alertness. We're not going to feel that a relaxation sort of sensation, we're going to feel more anxious, we're going to feel more agitated, and therefore we're getting these withdrawal symptoms from our lack of nicotine. So therefore what happens, according to this nicotine regulation model, somebody's going to become addicted to avoid these unpleasant symptoms of upregulation. So to avoid withdrawal symptoms, they are going to have another cigarette. So this repetition of upregulation and downregulation over time is also going to cause chronic desensitization of nicotinic receptors. And that can only be overcome by increased nicotine uptake. So in other words, tolerance has developed and they're going to need more and more to get the same effect. And obviously in long term, continuous exposure of nicotinic receptors to nicotine causes permanent changes in your brain neurochemistry. So just going back to um, do a really quick recap. So when nicotine, when we take, when we smoke, for example, take in nicotine, it binds with the, these nicotinic receptors. They are initially stimulated, but then they shut down and um, it blocks the reception of ACH. And that means that we have down regulation. There is not so many ACH uh, receptors available and that will lead to desensitization of the neuron. As, as I've said already, that desensitization then triggers off release of more dopamine. And that is what causes us to have that mild euphoria and alertness, etc., with that we get with cigarettes, with nicotine. Um, and obviously that is then becomes a learnt response. And without it, if we withdraw from it, therefore we um, get the awful withdrawal symptoms and that will entice somebody to go and have another cigarette. Okay, a little bit of evidence to support this model. We've got different texts here. McAvoy, for example, a group of patients with schizophrenia who smoke cigarettes method. They were monitored for their smoking intake whilst they were taking certain medication called haloperidol, which is an antagonist that blocks the dopamine receptors. And the results were that they found that these patients smoked increasingly significant more cigarettes, um, really as a means of self-medicating to increase their dopamine levels. And that's what made them realize that, they, that, that dopamine was instrumental in this. And we have another piece of research there you can look at as well. But moving swiftly on to some evaluation, in terms of uh, what's useful about this model, well, it has practical applications. So we can use this, this knowledge to produce safer alternatives. So for example, nicotine patches. And nicotine patches will allow nicotine levels to be maintained and uh, hopefully eventually reduced, but without the harmful effects of inhaling, for, exa for example, um, and, and, and inhaling tar, for example. But also uh, this research leads to the possibility that we may <clears throat> in the future have a nicotine immunization. Problem with it though, one criticism is it's seen as reductionist because it ex explains addiction really just on this fundamental level in terms of uh, molecules only. And it ignores those really important social cultural effects that seem to be instrumental also in, um, in encouraging the initiation and also maintenance of um, smoking. So here peer pressure, social norms for example and a piece of research Troy et al found that most adolescents who became dependent had peers who smoked so evidence that those other factors are really important as well. <clears throat> and finally this explanation also can't explain why about 50% of people who smoke um, uh, don't become addicted. Um, so about 50% who do become addicted and the other 50% don't. So Schiffman, for example, referred to chippers, people who regularly smoke, for example, an average of five a day, but they don't become dependent. This suggests that there are significant individual differences that affect dependence. And the suggestion here was that there are other factors like social learning theory and modeling and behavior that also play a role in dependency. And final criticism is this explanation just deals with dopamine. But there are other systems like GABA and serotonin pathways 
that also play a really big role in addiction and we need to know how dopamine interacts with these. So at present it's seen as an incomplete explanation or, or rather there is a criticism that it is not fully complete. So this is the first explanation, nicotine explanation. Uh, the second one is learning theory as applied to smoking behaviour, so explaining nicotine addiction through learning theory, which will be on a separate video.